So I was super excited when I first learned about integrated information theory and realized that this was the theory that actually made a bunch of testable predictions that hadn't been tested yet. So I'm going to tell you about my work to try to help make it even more testable. Why might you want to do that? Well, first of all, the beautiful formulas that Giulio and Masafumi and others have, have published, when I first saw them, I thought they looked a little bit arbitrary, and I was nervous that maybe there's a million other ways you could define phi also. So how do we know that this is what we're going to test? Secondly, as we'll get back to, they, they, in their original form, take a very long time to evaluate, which can get in the way of testing. So I'm going to talk about measuring phi in practice. You might want to do it for, to convince yourselves that you found the right formula then. And you might also do it in the hope that you can find really good approximations so we can put these theories to the test. So the, the, the idea of the gist of integration that we would want any definition of phi to obey is that if you have a system that evolves in time, according to some mechanism, you, if you can cut the system like Masafumi showed here, in such a way that, the two, that you still get the same prediction even though the parts don't talk to each other, you say no integration. Phi equals zero. Any measure should satisfy that. So to figure out what's the best of all possible definitions satisfying this, well, we want to first work out the set of all possible phi definitions satisfying this, and then we want to decide what do we mean by good, and then pick out the best one. There are many different things you might mean by good, and we heard a bunch about that from Julio, you can have your own preference philosophically for what should be good, and then you can r rank all the possible ones against that. So to make this a bit more formal, a mechanism you can describe beautifully as a, a Markov process, where, you have, where the probability distribution of the state here initially just gets multiplied by some big Markov matrix to give the probability distribution in the future. And in this language, phi equals zero just corresponds in geek speak to saying that this matrix is tensor factorizable. Okay? And in this language, it turns out that there are not gazillions of different ways you can define phi. Because you can break down your choice of phi measure into just a small sequence of choices on this page here. First, you pick your recipe specifying which way you're going to factorize your method. And it turns out that there are actually only five that are really nice. You might pick the optimal fi factorization given the state that you're in, or optimize for some random state, or optimize on average, or do what is called noising in IIT. So you've got five options there. Then you are going to compare, as Masafumi said, how accurately the uh, exact probability distribution is approximated by this distribution you get when you cut the system in two. So there are five, four times three equals 12 different ways you can pick out what probabilities you're going to compare. You can, you can look at the probability distribution jointly over all four of these guys here, or just the future probabilities, the past, or just one of the future subsystems. And you can choose whether you're going to do conditional probabilities based on knowing the state or not, or blah, blah, blah. Only 12 options. And finally, to compare how well the exact and approximate probability distribution agree, there are only seven good options for doing that that are in the literature <coughs> or I think are interesting in any other way. And um, here they are. And Masafumi already mentioned both the earth mover distance and the KL divergence options here. So when you put all this together, you, you don't get a Google Plex different Phi definitions, you get only 5 times 3 times 4 times 7, 420 options, which is kind of manageable. And when I looked more carefully at this, it got even better, because a lot of these definitions turn out to always give phi equals 0. And a whole bunch of other ones, in fact, most of the other ones, turn out to be equal to one of the other options, or be things you have, can discard because they have horrible properties by, by anybody's standards. And at the end of the day, you narrow it down to just a quite short list of phi definitions. Don't worry about all the nerdy math here. The point is just that there is nerdy math. These are all just different formulas that you can apply to data to test the theory. And, and there are formulas both for when you work in terms of bits and when you, if you want to make the approximation in the lab when you're doing 
ECOG data, or whatever, of having continuous variables and approximating them as Gaussians. And if you then take all these <laughs> different me measures here in different columns and you score them against these nice properties that you like, you get this. And uh, you can um, also plot each one of these as a function of how big your system is for various random tests and so on. And you find that some of them behave pretty similarly to others. Others behave a little bit differently. And um, the bottom line of this analysis, which I spent way more time on than I, I care to admit, is actually, I think, very good news for, for Julio and Masafumi and, and Larissa and the others who, who have been working on this. Because it turns out that their measures that they have proposed aren't just two kind of arbitrary ones among a billion. They're actually ones which, among all the ones that you can look at, come out at <coughs> right, around, right at the top of, of the list for, for having really nice qualities. And I think, in particular, this mismatch decoding one, which Masafumi has published a lot about, has its really, really nice properties. So this is, this is, this is one of my favorites now. So that's good news, I think. Now for the, some bad news, even this, now you can feel good about those formulas, but you still can't calculate them in practice. Why not? Because even for a very small data set, if you have, say, 70 pieces in your system, how many ways can you subdivide 70 pieces into even two parts? Way more ways than there are atoms in our universe, right? So you can keep trying things until hell freezes over, and you still won't sure, be sure that you even have found the cruelest cut that minimizes phi and, and know what the answer is. So that's kind of a bummer. So I also worked out an approximation where you can actually approximate phi, which with, the with, the which with um, as I'll show you, works quite good in practice and cuts the time scaling from n factorial to n squared, which is a lot better. And the idea uses graph theory, and it's very intuitive. If I give you some kind of matrix which tells you the coupling, the extent to which um, each little element now affects each element later. Let's think of the case where you have a bunch of wires you've measured off of some patient and so that you just get the next state by multiplying the old vector of 70 things by this matrix. Okay? If, if you could somehow permute all of your rows and columns, permute all your wires in such a way that the matrix became block diagonal like this, that would mean that there are two sets of wires that aren't talking with each other at all, and, and phi equals zero. But you don't want to do that by trying out 70 factorial permutations, right? Because that would take a ridiculously long time. Fortunately, you don't need to. If I give you this matrix back in the permuted form, where it's kind of hard to see whether you, there is a permutation making a block diagonal, you can just draw this matrix as a graph just showing which thing is connected to which thing. And you say, wow, this is a, the, not the connected graph. It has two parts. That's easy to do with an n-squared algorithm. So the approximation that I propose is if you have an actual thing where it's not so simple that you have a bunch of zero elements, you just put in a cut, and you decide any coupling that's weaker than that cut, you set it to zero, and then look at the graph. And then you keep dialing up this cut so it gets more and more cruel until you've managed to chop things apart so that the biggest connected component is only, say, half the size. And then you use that particular cut as the cruelest one. You go back to the original system, calculate phi with your favorite formula, and boom, there you go. It works quite well in practice. I tested it with a whole bunch of random simulations here. And for out of these thousands of simulations, 60% of them got exactly the right phi, found exactly the right cut. And in general, when you have a system where the cruelest subdivision gives significantly less subdivision than the sort of most generous one, you tend to always kind of nail it. The approximation doesn't do as well when, when um, it's very, very integrated and, and pretty much all cuts sort of give the same. But even then, you often get things right to within 10% or so. And I'd much rather get things right to within 10% than having to wait a, a trillion years for the answer. So I think it's going to be really fun to actually for the community around the world to actually perform more of these cool experimental tests. Because even though people often think consciousness sounds very philosophical, this is a very, very testable theory. And I'm so grateful to those of you who came up with it and stuck your neck out. Uh, now, 
I've, let me, since this is the end of, of the talk part of this section, zoom out a little bit from the specific topic of consciousness to the topic of the whole conference, physics of events and observers. And uh, advertise how exciting it is to work on things at the interface between physics, neuroscience, and AI, which I like to call uh, the physics of, of cognitive systems so that my department chair should feel that I'm doing physics. <laughs> now, of course, what we've heard about from Julio and, and Masafumi sits right here. Things to do with consciousness. But I want to just say to you all that there are also a lot of other very, very cool problems here in this space which are often many, very, very connected to stuff you're already working in. And I want to invite you to hear by, by showing you another couple of examples of cool things there. Let's start with this example. This is a very crazy little plot where you have on the same scale, x and y axis, English, French, music by Bach, the human genome, and then the critical 2D Ising model, two-dimensional magnetism. So physics and non-physics together, and the curves even look kind of the same. What on earth is going on here? This is a cool example of where you can apply physics tools to study things which physicists usually don't look at. This is work together with Henry Lin, and um, it's well known in that if you, if for systems in physics that we, we measure things called correlation functions. You can't measure the correlation function for music by Bach because it involves multiplying things in the definition and I can't multiply two musical notes by each other. So we, Henry and I generalized this idea by instead plotting mutual information. How much information in bits does the tone or whatever played now tell you about what's happening, for example, 15 tones later, okay? And you see you get these beautiful power laws of slope about minus one half, which is exactly what you also get for the famous critical Ising model of physics. In contrast, if you have a typical physical system not in anywhere near a phase transition, you, you get exponential decay, which is also what you get when you, when you use Markov processes, where each process effect thing is just kind of determining the next to the next to the next. And um, this, was, this text actually contained a bunch of poems, and we suspect that's why there was more long-term structure in it. Although it would be fun to look, it would be fun to compare with Italian. So anyway, I'll take questions in a sec there. But what? This is Wikipedia text, so it also has a bunch of HTML-style gobbledygook and structure, which correlates for longer. But the cool thing to note here is, that if you take a physical system like water and you put it right at a phase transition, so it's on the, it's on the verge of freezing, from, for example, from from liquid to solid, then these sort of exponential decay things well known to turn into power laws. The thing becomes sort of fractal, scale invariant. We call this a critical phenomena in physics. And it's well known that you can only get these sort of things, these sort of phase transitions or critical phenomena, in systems that have more than one dimension. Two-dimensional magnets, three-dimensional, but not one-dimensional. But English and music and stuff seem like one-dimensional sequences, right? So how can you get phase something like criticality there? Is there some sort of hidden dimension in English? Well, Henry and I argue that there actually is. And what we show is that whenever you have a recursive process where, the, where parts generate smaller parts, which generate smaller parts, you tend to get scale invariance. Alan Guth knows all about this because in the baby universe, if it's inflating, one Hubble volume generates fluctuations and then it, it, double, it doubles its size and then the different subvolumes again do the same, everything repeats recursively and we have beautiful scale invariant fluctuations in the early universe that we can see and the baby pictures of our universe in the micro background, right? People who study turbulence know the same thing, that a mother vortex can cause baby vortices, which cause more and more. And whenever you have causation of this type, which isn't just linear, one-dimensional, where one thing causes the next, but where we have sort of a hierarchical tree, you, um, you can get these kind of long-range correlations. And if you think about it, English is a lot like that. You're writing a paper, you have ideas. And then you break it down into sections, and then break them down into paragraphs, and into words, and phonemes, and letters. If you listen to music by Bach, it's full of a hierarchy of structures like this. So maybe we shouldn't be so shocked. And this can also be, be quite useful to better model language, which people are trying to do, people like Bart Selman. It turns out that long, short-term memory models, this especially for Bart, in machine learning can exactly do this kind of stuff. Now, one more little example during my last three minutes, four minutes, 
of a cool application of physics to things that we usually don't think of as physics that come from AI or neuroscience is this. We heard from Bart on the first day that machine learning, the deep learning, works remarkably well for doing all sorts of things. Like, for example, taking an image and telling you who it is, or looking at an image with a million pixels and telling you whether that's a cat or not. Okay? But if you think about it a bit more, it's kind of shocking that it works so well. That because if this is a me megapixel image, even if it's just black and white bits, there are then two to the power of one million possible images, right? So to specify an arbitrary function of this that is going to tell you the probability that any image is a cat, I need to specify two to the power of one million probabilities. Two to the one million parameters is more than parameters than there are atoms in our universe, right? So how can deep learning possibly be such cheap learning that you can get away with only a million parameters or a thousand parameters when you should need a redonkulous number of parameters? This must mean this, that deep learning that can fit on your laptop or GPU cannot, cannot describe at all well almost any functions at all. There's a tiny fraction of all functions. Yet Bart was super excited because it works great for all the functions that he and his colleagues care about. That must mean that the functions that they care about are very special somehow. Why is this? Well, Henry and I claim that the answer to this cannot be found in mathematics alone but that it can be found in physics. Because if, what is it that the Bart and his AI colleagues are looking at? They're looking at natural images or drawings that are or things that are inspired by natural images. And natural images are not random images. Random images are looking distinguishable from pure noise, right? If, if you take the logarithm of a probability distribution of something in physics, that's basically the Hamiltonian in the Boltzmann distribution exponent, right? What kind of function is the Hamiltonian of our universe? It's not an arbitrary function. It's a, a really extremely simple special function. For the standard model, it's a polynomial. That's very special. It's only a quartic polynomial, in fact. And it's also incredibly sparse because of locality. The terms you find in the polynomial only involve point things very close together multiplied together. It also has incredible symmetry. So the total parameter count is very small. And what we show in this paper is that this, this sort of swindle that makes these kind of net neural nets work so well is hinging on the fact that they can only model a very small class of functions, but that turns out to be very much the same class of functions that the natural world that physics actually gives us. You can also ask why deep? Why, do you, why does it help to have deep learning? I'm going to skip over the details of that in the interest of time, but just tempt you by saying that it has to do with also very important things in physics, such as renormalization and the process by which we get rid of unwanted things we don't care about and distill out the information that we do care about in a, in a series of steps. So in summary, I want to invite you all to come to this beautiful place here, not just in Banff, but here in particular, to the wonderful interface between physics, neuroscience, and AI, because there are a lot of wonderful ways here we can apply our physics knowledge to things that physicists have not traditionally worked on, but where we can apply our traditional tools that we know and love and do new cool things. So thank you.